If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to the Jews, Amen, amen, I say to you. Whoever keeps my word will never see death. So the Jews said to him, Now we are sure that you are possessed. Abraham died as did the prophets. Yet you say, Whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Or the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is worth nothing. But it is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. Yet you do not know Him, but I know Him. And if I should say that I do not know Him, I would be like you, a liar. But I do know Him, and I keep His word. Abraham, your father, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid and went out of the temple area. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, aren't you glad that we postponed the mission due to the inundation of snow we had yesterday? But it is a poignant reminder to all of us that ultimately, weather and so much else, everything else, literally, is in the hands of God. I'm going to begin with an amusing story this evening, but I have to warn you that it's not theologically sound. It's only for purposes of humor. But there was this politician who was known for his shady dealings, but he was also a rather good man in many ways. Well, one day he was walking down the street, crossing a busy intersection, and was hit by a tractor trailer, died on the spot. He comes up to heaven to the pearly gates, and there he is met by St. Peter. And St. Peter tells him, well, we're a little confused about you. God gave us a message to let you know that we're not sure if you should be up here in heaven or if you should be in hell, because your life was kind of a mixed bag. Some shady dealings of dishonesty on the one hand, but yet some charitable work and good that you did for many people on the other. So he said, we're going to do something very unusual. We're going to let you spend 24 hours in hell and then 24 hours in heaven. And based on how you've lived your life, you can make the decision. And so first, he goes down to hell, and St. Peter lets him in, and all of a sudden he sees these vast golf courses, and he sees all of his friends there laughing and drinking, smoking cigars, and playing golf with holes in one. And then, after the golf game was concluded, they went into the clubhouse and enjoyed lobster and champagne and caviar. Even the devil was telling jokes and dancing gleefully. And then the 24 hours passed quickly, and St. Peter came down to retrieve him, brought him up to heaven. And in heaven he enters there, and he finds angels and saints and holy souls dwelling in perfect bliss, listening to harp music and Gregorian chant and beholding the great light before them. And he spends 24 hours there. And St. Peter comes up to him and says, Now, you've spent 24 hours in hell, 24 hours in heaven. Where do you think you should be? And the politician reflected for a minute, and then he said, Well, I would never have said it before. I mean, heaven is delightful, but 
but I think I would be better off in hell. So St. Peter escorts him to the elevator. He goes down, down, down to hell, and as soon as the elevator doors open, again, it's not theologically sound, he's met by a wall of flames and serpents and hideous creatures and demons with instruments of torture, and all of his friends look miserable. And the devil comes over to him, puts his arm around him, and says, Welcome. And the politician said, well, I don't understand. He said, yesterday I was here and there was a golf course and a clubhouse. We ate lobster and caviar, drank champagne. The devil was telling jokes. Now there is just torment and misery. What happened? The devil looks at him and grins and said, yesterday we were campaigning. Now you voted. <laughs> And if there are any politicians here, present company excluded. <laughs> I'm going to begin talking about hell this evening because I want to end on a hopeful note with talking about purgatory. But one of the most classic descriptions of hell that we find in all of literature is found in Dante's 14th century allegory and trilogy, The Divine Comedy. And this epic poem is as I mentioned, made up of three parts, the Inferno, followed by the Purgatorio, followed by the Paradiso. And the Inferno relates the journey of Dante through hell guided by the Roman poet Virgil. And hell is depicted as nine concentric circles of punishment and torment that fit the crime of the sinners who inhabit those realms. And you will remember, if you ever read the Divine Comedy, that over the gate of hell, there is a sign that reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. The first circle of hell, interestingly enough, in Dante's configuration, is limbo. People have asked me about limbo in these missions during the season of Lent. In Dante's limbo, we find people like Homer, Socrates, and Aristotle, basically good people, but unbaptized pagans. What about limbo? Well, in the fifth century, St. Augustine concluded that infants who died without baptism were consigned to hell. And among the many words we find in sacred scripture, the words of Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 5, seem clearest. Unless you are born of water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that led St. Augustine to deduce that those who are unbaptized go to hell. Later theologians surmised that this was not really in accord with a merciful God. And limbo was proposed as a theological theory only. But it was defined according to many sources, as a state which includes the souls of infants who die subject to original sin and without baptism and who neither merit the beatific vision of heaven nor are subjected to any punishment because they are not guilty of personal sin. Now, limbo, though widely believed and taught, was never, ever part of the Catholic magisterium, the official teaching of the Catholic Church. As such, it was never really done away with because it was never dogmatically defined in the first place. The Vatican does not reject the theory of limbo outright. It remains a possible theological hypothesis. And the truth is that we don't know for certain. God has not revealed to us the answer to that question. It's not like heaven hell and purgatory, which are doctrines of faith. And so it remains that Catholics are free to believe or disbelieve the proposition of limbo. What we do know and what the Catechism teaches is that these souls are entrusted to the mercy of God and the hope that Christ will provide a means of salvation for them. Pope Benedict XVI, arguably the best Pope theologian in modern times, accepted a document that was proposed by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the International Theological Commission. And in accepting this, he basically said that we are not obligated to believe 
in the state of limbo. The last paragraph of the document summarizes it well. As regards children who have died without baptism, the church can only entrust them to the mercy of God as she does in her funeral rites for them. Indeed, the great mercy of God, who desires that all should be saved, and Jesus' tenderness toward children, which caused him to say, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, Mark 10, verse 14, allows us to hope that there is a way of salvation for children who have died without baptism. So again, just to be clear, limbo has never been officially part of the magisterium of the church, and Catholics are not obligated to believe it. It is, however, a possible theological proposition. But heaven, hell, and purgatory are not propositions of theology. They are doctrines and dogmas of divine revelation. Those who are in hell, and we cannot be sure how many, are those who die unrepentant in mortal sin. And the privation of the beatific vision is the ultimate loss, the loss of God's love. And our Lord himself referred to this repeatedly as everlasting fire. And hell is a permanent state of the soul. The souls in hell are beyond help. And though some fathers of the church, particularly Origen, who lapsed into heresy, believed that hell would someday be emptied and that there would be a universal redemption. And there are some modern theologians who believe that hell exists because it is a necessity of God's justice, but it is empty because of God's mercy. Well, it is not contrary to God's mercy to punish souls in hell for all eternity. As a matter of fact, his perfect justice demands it for those who don't want salvation, who repeatedly resist his mercy and remain unrepentant in grave sin. St. John Vianney, the patron saint of priests, once asked rhetorically, shall we all be saved? Shall we go to heaven? Alas, my children, we do not know at all, but I tremble when I see so many souls lost these days. See, they fall into hell as leaves fall from the trees at the approach of winter. St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Alphonsus Liguri, and other saints, again, a matter of theological opinion, it's not a dogma, believe that those who are saved are in the minority. That we cannot know. We have to leave it up to God's mercy. But in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor, the patron saint of our parish, St. John Paul II, made it clear that we are free to accept or reject the laws and the love of God, but we are not free to accept the consequences. So in life, we are free to reject his laws and his love, but we are not free to reject the consequences of our decision. If we turn from God deliberately and with malice, then St. John Paul II said, we enter into the realm of disorder, alienation, and hatred. And he went so far as to say as a personalist theologian that we carry our personalities into eternity. We ratify what we have chosen to become in life. In his general audience of July 28, 1999, he said the following, hell is not so much a punishment imposed externally by God, but a development of premises already set by people in this life, a regular refusal of God's love and mercy. Remember, we discussed the unforgivable sin, the obdurate heart, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, the life that remains impenetrable to the mercy of God. So theologically speaking, hell is the ultimate consequence of sin. But eternal damnation, as St. John Paul II so beautifully put it, is not attributed to God's initiative, because in his merciful love, he desires the salvation of all people. In reality, it is the human person himself or herself who closes himself or herself to God's mercy and love. And following from this, damnation is the definitive separation, freely chosen by the human person and confirmed with death that seals his or her choice forever. God simply ratifies this state in his perfectly just judgment.
Here's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us on the topic of hell. Paragraph 1033 reads, We cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love him. But we cannot love God if we sin gravely against him, against our neighbor, or against ourselves. To die in mortal sin without repenting and accepting God's merciful love means remaining separated from him forever by our own free choice. This state of definitive self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed is called hell. The Catechism in paragraph 1037 concludes, the affirmations of sacred scripture and the magisterium of the church on the subject of hell are a call to the responsibility incumbent upon us to make use of our freedom now in view of our eternal destiny, as I mentioned from the outset of this mission, to become eternally minded. The Catechism goes on, we are at the same time called urgently to conversion. Enter by the narrow gate, Jesus said, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Hence, the opinions of Thomas Aquinas and Alphonsus Liguri and others. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Many of you are very familiar with St. Faustina Kowalska, the Polish mystic, and the one who gave us the revelations of divine mercy. Well, she was given some privileged glimpses of the afterlife as part of her mystical communion with God. And in an excerpt from her diary, she describes hell in this way, rather frightening. She said, today I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It is a place of great torture, how awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of tortures I saw, the first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. We torture ourselves, having lost God, in other words. The third is that one's condition will never change. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul, a terrible suffering. The fifth torture is a continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and the souls of the damned see each other and all the evil, both of others and their own. And the sixth torture is the constant company of Satan, and the seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses, and blasphemies. And she concludes, each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. But I noticed one thing, she said, that most of the souls there are those who disbelieved that there was a hell. End of quote. Remember I told you that 72% of Americans believe in heaven, but only 58% of Americans believe in hell. Hell is the realm of the unrepentant prideful. We might say... The national anthem of hell could be the song, I did it my way. I'm in no way inferring that Frank Sinatra <laughs> is down there. But that's basically what prideful and unrepentant souls say. I did it and want to do it my way, not God's way. The fallen angels are called demons because they rebelled against God and gave a definitive no to his love and mercy. And what happened to them is a warning to us to avoid the tragic consequences of a definitive no and conform our lives to that of Jesus Christ, who lived a definitive, obedient yes to the will of the Father. Try to remember that. The national anthem of hell, I did it my way. Now let's talk about more hopeful things in purgatory. St. Augustine teaches us that during the time which intervenes between man's death 
and the final resurrection, souls remain in states especially reserved for them, according to each, as each one is deserving, of the eternal beatitude or tribulation for the disposition one has made of his life while living in the flesh. End of quote. I mentioned on the second night of the mission that the second coming of Christ at the end of time and the general judgment will be the time that bodies, glorified bodies, will be united to souls for all eternity. And purgatory will come to an end. But lest we think that the glorified body is only destined for heaven, there is also the resurrection of condemnation. Bodies will be joined to souls for the eternal punishment of hell. We wouldn't call them glorified bodies. We'd call them something else, like tormented bodies. The transitory state of pur purification of purgatory comes to an end. But purgatory is one of the most commonly misunderstood teachings of the Catholic Church, and it is a unique teaching of the Catholic Church, though some other Christian denominations also espouse belief in some form of purgatory. I was recently watching one of the police shows on television, Chicago PD, and one of the policemen was trying to explain to another what purgatory was. And he said, purgatory is like a way station between heaven and hell. Well, again, that's not theologically sound, but not too far from the truth either. But let me clarify what purgatory is not. It is not a second chance for damned souls to repent. Instead, as I mentioned, it is a refining fire, a state of cleansing and purification of souls destined for heaven. But it's not a means to earn our way to heaven but a gift of God's mercy, preparing us to see him face to face. And the Bible alludes to it indirectly, and I'll discuss that momentarily. But on All Souls Day, we pray for the holy souls in purgatory. We call them holy because they're ultimately going to get to heaven. It's not a perpetual state of punishment. And they're not going to go to hell. So they're holy. They died in the friendship of God, but with attachment to some form of sin. We also call them the poor souls because they've not yet attained the fullness of eternal life with God. And so on All Saints Day, I always wear white vestments, but on All Souls Day, it's the only day of the year that I wear black vestments as a symbolic reminder that we must pray for the souls who have yet to come into perfect eternal life. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but who are still imperfectly purified, but assured of eternal salvation, undergo this purification. And to this state, the church gives the name purgatory, from the Latin purgare, which means to cleanse or purify. And again, this doctrine is not some construct of mankind. It is derived from scripture. It was dogmatically defined at some councils in the 13th century, the Second Council of Lyon, and the Council of Florence in the 15th century, and most especially the Council of Trent in the 16th century. That doesn't mean that purgatory came along in the Middle Ages. It has always existed, and it is a gift of God's loving mercy. If you recall, on the first night of the mission, I said, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that death puts an end to human life as the time to, of either accepting or rejecting the divine grace manifested in Christ. So when we go to confession, we are experiencing repentance, we are showing remorse and contrition, and we receive absolution if we are truly contrite and our hearts are open to God's mercy and our sins are forgiven. But because of the perfect love of God and our imperfect love, there is a gap. There is the need to satisfy God's justice. There is temporal punishment that remains at times. And temporal punishment is the purification of the unhealthy attachment to things of the world, which is a consequence of the effects of sin that perdure even after death. And so God purifies the soul of anything that gets in the way of experiencing the fullness of his presence in heaven. Now, we can be purified during earthly life. 
through redemptive suffering, through conversion, through acts of charity. You've heard people say, I'm doing my purgatory on earth. But the state of purgatory in the afterlife, and it is a state, it's not a landscape, it's a process, it's not space and time as we understand it. But in the state of purgatory, the souls benefit not from their own prayers, because as I mentioned, death puts an end to our ability to accept or reject God's grace. But the souls in purgatory benefit from the prayers of the church militant on earth, that's all of us, and the church triumphant in heaven. The, saint, the saints praying for the souls in purgatory. St. Augustine said, It cannot be doubted that the prayers of the church relieve the holy souls and move God to treat them with more clemency than their sins deserve. Now, some of our detractors and critics say, Well, the Catholic Church made up purgatory. This is part of like religion as the opium of the people. That is not the case. We find references in sacred scripture. Let me just give you a couple. In the second book of Maccabees, we find Judas Maccabeus recommending prayers for deceased soldiers who had worn pagan amulets. In other words, they had fought for the right cause, but they had compromised their virtue by wearing pagan amulets. And Judas Maccabeus recommends prayers and sacrifices that will be efficacious for the dead. So that's biblical support for the teaching of purgatory, although Protestant biblical canons leave the first and second book of Maccabees, among other books, out of the canon altogether. But if we're going to pray efficaciously for souls, they have to be in a place or in a state, let me restate that, where they'll benefit from our prayers. They don't need our prayers in heaven. They don't benefit from our prayers in hell. In Wisdom chapter 3, reading that we often read at funerals, as gold in the furnace, God proved them. And as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. Again, the concept of a refining fire. In the Gospel of John, no one less than Jesus himself says, And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. How does this refer to purgatory? Well, God wants to give us every chance to benefit from his healing and purging mercy. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 says, A person will be saved, but only as through fire. That can't be a reference to hellfire, otherwise the word saved wouldn't be in that verse. Revelations chapter 21, verse 27, leads us, to the conclusion that purgatory is a theological necessity because nothing unclean shall ever enter the presence of God. Revelations 21, 27. I'm going to conclude this mission by citing Pope Benedict XVI and recommending a book to you that's deep in its content and in its formulation, but it's probably the best book written on the subject. It's called Eschatology. If you recall... When I began this mission, I mentioned eschatology as the study of the last things in theology. And Pope Benedict XVI, I believe, has the most beautiful description of purgatory I have ever, ever encountered in my theological reading. And he was influenced in this description by the mystical visions of the 16th century nun, St. Catherine of Genoa, who basically came to the conclusion that purgatory is not a landscape when we pray for people to emerge from the state of purgatory, we're not talking about months and years. We're talking about intensity of punishment because space and time are things only of this world. And St. Catherine of Genoa said that the fire of purgatory is a fire of love, not a fire of punishment, and it's an internal rather than an external fire. She, like St. Faustina, had mystical insight that God had given her through glimpses of purgatory. This influenced Pope Benedict. He writes the following. Purgatory is not some kind of otherworldly concentration camp. Rather, it is the inwardly necessary process of transformation which makes a person become capable of Christ and capable of God. Kapatz Dei. And he said... 
The fire which, with, which both burns and saves is Christ himself, the judge and savior. And the encounter with him is the decisive act of judgment. Before him, all falsehood melts away. The encounter with him as it burns us, transforms us and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves and capable of God. Because all that we build during our lives can prove to be mere straw, pure bluster, and it collapses. Yet in the pain of this encounter with divine love, when the impurity and sickness of our lives become evident to us, there lies salvation. His gaze, the touch of his heart, heals us through an undeniably painful transformation as through fire. The words of St. Paul. Pope Benedict goes on to write, It is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us, enabling us to become totally ourselves and thus totally of God. And in this way, the interrelation between justice and grace becomes clear. The way we live our lives is not immaterial, but our defilement does not stain us forever if we have at least continued to reach out towards Christ, towards truth, and towards love. Indeed, it has already been burned away through the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. And at the moment of the particular judgment, we experience and we absorb the overwhelming power of his love over all the evil in the world and in ourselves. And this pain of love becomes our salvation and joy. Again, I believe it's the most beautiful description of purgatory I've ever encountered. So in conclusion to our three nights, this doctrine of the last things, not meant to frighten us, but to lead us to live more faithful, committed Christian lives in the world and to love the Lord with deeper conviction and to never cease to reach out for his divine mercy. Each and every day of our lives, we must strive to be eternally minded people. And only in this so-called eschatological focus can we realize the consequential harm of our sins and be moved in faith to penance, conversion, and reconciliation with God. And heeding the words of Jesus, be vigilant and stay awake. Don't procrastinate. Death may come like a thief in the night. And as St. Angela Merici, the 16th century Italian mystic, once said, do now do today what you would do if you knew this was to be your last day on earth. Unless we end on a note of dread, I share with you these wise and consoling words of St. John Vianney, so pastoral and so beautiful. See, my children, a person who is in a state of sin is always sad. Whatever he does, he is weary and disgusted with everything. While he who is at peace with God is always joyous. To be loved by God, to be united with God, to live in the presence of God, to live for God. Oh, what a beautiful life. Oh, what a beautiful death. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.